Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome on into the show. It's very nice to see you all here. Uh, we don't have very many online events this month, so it's glad to see that you're taking uh, advantage of the opportunity you have to watch this wonderful one. So please allow me to welcome you to Conversations with Authors. Today we bring to you um, both Matt Zeppelin and David Hinton for the book Wild Mind, Wild Earth. Um, but before we get to our speakers properly, please allow me to welcome you mm. to Conversa Book Passages, Conversations with Authors. Uh, if you've seen one of these events before, well, then welcome back. Uh, but if you're new here, then Book Passage is a group of independently run bookstores out of the San Francisco Bay Area. We host and run book talks just like these very often throughout the week. Uh, as we're now streaming on YouTube and will continue to do so in the future, please consider subscribing by clicking the subscribe button just below the video. It's completely free to you. It helps us out a lot. And... As an added bonus, if you click the little bell next to the subscribe button, you'll be alerted every time that we go live with one of these talks so you don't have to miss out on something you otherwise might have really enjoyed. Uh, if you'd like to check out our upcoming events or just like the idea of an email newsletter more, you can find both of those at bookpassage.com. Uh, and if you want to grab uh, any of the any of the books that you might uh, enjoy, anything that's talk, talked about tonight, uh, or our speaker's book, which again is Wild Mind, Wild Earth, uh, you can find that at bookpassage.com as well. And last, this is very important. If you have any questions tonight, please take the time to write them in the YouTube chat. That's the only way to get your questions to our speakers tonight, and we will do our best to pass them along and get to them as we can. Now, allow me to introduce, first up, David Hinton, uh, who has published numerous books of poetry and essays, uh, and many translations of ancient Chinese poetry and philosophy, all informed by an abiding interest in deep ecological thinking. This widely acclaimed work has earned Hinton a Guggenheim Fellowship, numerous fellowships from NEA and NEH, and both, the major, both of the major awards given for poetry in the United States, the Landon Translation Award and the Penn American Translation Award. Most recently, Hinton has received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In conversation tonight, we have Matt Zeppelin, who uh, is an acquiring editor at Shambhala Publications and has, edit and has edited David Hinton's last three books with Shambhala, uh, which are Wild Mind, Wild Earth, China Root, and Awakened Cosmos. A longtime Zen practitioner with interests in ch um, traditional Chinese culture and the intersection of contemporary Buddhism and ecology, he lives with his wife and baby daughter in Durango, Colorado. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. Now, please allow me to pass the show off to our two speakers tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Nick. It's great to be here. And David, it's great to see you. You and I send each other a lot of emails, and it's nice to see your face. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Nice to see you in your in your workroom, which I've never seen before. Here it is. <laughs> um, good. So... Um, like Nick said, um, I'm David's editor at Shambhala. Um, Wild Mind, Wild Earth is the third book that we've worked on together with several more in the works. And um, we're gonna have a conversation about the book's topics tonight. Um, but like Nick said, we're interested in questions from the audience. If you have questions about this book or about uh, David's other books or translations, uh, or about anything that's interesting to you, just put it in the chat and we'll address it maybe a little as we go or, or definitely in the last 10, 15 minutes of the event. Um, but we wanted to start out uh, just giving you a sample of the book. So David, I just want to invite you to read, I think a, a little bit from the beginning and a little bit from the end of the book. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, are you still there? Uh, I only see a couple of three participants, the three of us. Is this thing, is this hooked up? Is the the network working right? Yeah, the, the network's the network has a sound Okay, correct. all right, good. So I there, just checked there to are... make sure some button needed to be clicked. No, 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 all we're right. all here. No worries. Um, so I'm gonna read um uh the beginning end of the first chapter, and this is um the, the first part of the book is called How a Little Poem from Ancient China Could Save the Planet. Um so I'll read two passages ending with that little poem. Um, before intention and choice, 
Before ideas and understanding and everything we think we know about ourselves, we love this world around us. How can that be? How can we love all this when our cultural assumptions tell us in so many ways that we humans are fundamentally other than nature and that nature's only real value is how it supports our well being? There's no love in that. Doesn't love require kindred natures? And what is kindred and what is kinship with wild earth but wild mind? How else could we feel exhilarating awe when a majestic orca whale leaps joyfully? Yes, forget anthropomorphism because they are so like us, so kindred, leaps joyfully out of the water, twisting spectacularly as it crashes back down, playing or celebrating or defiantly shouting, I'm here, I'm me to the world, to rivals, to family. And how else could we feel delight at orcas birthing, underwater midwifery and nurturing their young, or feel grief that Southern resident orcas of the Northwest coast are slowly starving to death, anger and guilt that it's because of us, the noise of industrial ship traffic disrupting the echolocation they need to locate prey, polluted seawater, Chinook salmon, their traditional prey, decimated by dammed rivers and overfishing and environmental toxins. We feel despair that because of so much stress, those orcas rarely give birth anymore, that the first baby in years died soon after birth and the mother carried it on her nose for 17 days, above water, hoping it would breathe, hoping it would somehow come back to life. Others sometimes took over the task to let the mother rest, but eventually mother and child both vanished. Heartbreaking, devastating. We love this world, this living planet. We feel joy when life thrives, grief when it suffers and dies. This may seem obvious and uninteresting in and of itself, but it's a mystery, isn't it? Because given our Western assumptions, it's inexplicable. Ancient Greek philosophy conjured a transcendental realm of pure idea that seemed more real and true than the empirical world around us. Because pure idea is changeless and therefore reliable, while wild earth is constantly changing and therefore unreliable. This transcendental realm was associated with an immortal soul, establishing a dualism that opens a fundamental rupture between mind and earth. That dualism set the course of Western consciousness, especially as combined with Christian theology, continuing today as an unnoticed cultural assumption that defines the very structure of our everyday experience. And it's quite the opposite of kinship or it tells us that we are not wild, not earth. It tells us instead that we are the noble human in strict opposition to the fundamentally other and lesser nature. Now to skip ahead to the end. We love this world, this living planet, and we also love the stars and galaxies. It's exhilarating to see telescopic images of stars scattered sparkling through space or clustered into swirling galaxies, to learn of their mind-bending lives, the way gravity condenses cosmic dust into stars and ignites them, then finally crushes them into themselves so violently that they explode and seed space with the rich dust that will become a new generation of stars and planets like ours. Our kinship seems to know no bounds, and in rediscovering that kinship, how can we help but discover the vast and beautiful dimensions of ourselves that had been lost? Human consciousness woven profoundly through the planetary ecosystem, woven indeed through the entire cosmos. Yes, we are much more than we think we are, and that is liberation of astounding proportions. Even simple perception, a gaze into star-strewn night skies, for instance, or stream water braiding liquid light between stones. In sight, we, saw, we find that utter belonging quite literally and scientifically true. The cosmos evolved countless suns and planets, 
And here on our planet Earth, it evolved life forms with image forming eyes like ours. So what else is that gaze but the very cosmos looking out at itself? What is thinking but the cosmos contemplating itself? And our inexplicable love for this world, our delight and grief, what is that but the cosmos loving itself, delighting in itself, grieving for itself? We are wild through and through, wild mind, wild earth, wild cosmos, this is how Paleolithic and ancient Chinese people understood it. And it seems clear enough, even self-evident, once we step outside the cultural assumptions we have inherited. This is our most magisterial identity, an identity that encompasses all of existence. The 10,000 things of earth and cosmos looking out through our eyes. In their expansive and ravishing dimensions, we find our kinship with those things our love and emotional entanglement. And we also find in ethics where what happens to earth quite literally happens to us. Who knew ethics could be so beautiful, this valuing of the 10,000 things, each in its own exquisite and individual clarity. Here it is that ethics distilled into a simple seeming little poem of crystalline seeing that was written by Dumu in ninth century China. Egrets, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade, they fish in shadowy streams. Then startling away into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a treefold, tumble in the evening wind. Hey, thank you so much, David. Um, I think that was a great choice for some readings because it swings from the emotional intensity, the grief of describing the mother orca carrying her her dead baby orca, oof, which is hard for me to read every time, um, to this uh, expansive liberatory writing that you do about uh, the practice of feeling oneself as part of the cosmos, as the cosmos, seeing seeing the cosmos. Um, so there's so much rich material for us to talk about. Um, and I, I wanted to start actually by asking you about that poem, Egrets, that you read at the end, and, and more generally about your practice of translation. Um, you've now published a series of books that are essays or prose writing where you uh, sprinkle some translations from the classical Chinese into them, Wild Mind, Wild Earth being one of those. And at the same time, you've continued publishing books that are primarily translation from classical Chinese poetry and religious writing. I've got to think there may be few people or no one else on earth who's translated more classical Chinese into English than you have now. So I wanted to ask you about the experience of translation for you at this point in your career. What, what's your process for approaching a poem like Egrets or, or a larger chunk of translation? And yeah, how has it changed for, me, for you over the decades since you began doing this kind of translation? Oh yeah, good question. Um, uh, maybe the last question first, how has it changed? I, th I think it's changed when I first started, I started as a poet. So I was translating to make contemporary poetry because ancient Chinese poetry has been part of modern American poetry for a hundred years since Ezra Pound kind of reinvented um, poetry by using the that kind of imagistic clarity of ancient Chinese. Um, and, uh, but more, as I translated more and more, I got more interested in um, sort of the philosophical foundation underneath the poetry. And that's what slowly led me to Chinese philosophy and then Chan, um, which is what um, I've been translating mostly lately. Chan is the, Jap the, Ch uh, the Chinese um, uh, pronunciation that 
of the the same phenomenon that we know as Zen, because it, it was called Chan in China where it was invented. And then when it moved to Japan, it, the name changed to, the pronunciation changed to Zen. Um, so that's mostly what I'm translating now. And um, and that's sort of what this wild mind grows out of that, that um, Chan Taoist and Chan Buddhist um, uh, conceptual framework uh, and how it's all about um, reweaving consciousness with um, natural process, with the unfolding of um, transformation, uh, which is what the Tao is. Uh, and in terms of doing it, it's for me, it's, um, I, I worked for some years as a, as a stonemason, uh, building st um, dry stone walls and terraces and staircases and things. And translation is very similar because it's, so just a very slow methodical thing where I sort of put one word next to another, next to another, and just slowly keep moving them around until they all fall into place. Um, and, you know, at some point that's, so it's kind of, it's very kind of methodic patient work at the beginning. And eventually my idea is that I want the ancient to be speaking in my voice and me to be speak, speaking in the ancient's voice. So at some point that sort of methodical building of a translation starts taking on a life as, as a poem or as a piece of literature. Uh, and then that's when it starts coming alive as a voice. And um, hopefully that voice is sort of a combination of mine and the, uh, or integration of mine and and that ancient uh, writer or philosopher, whoever it is. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks for for sharing that. I think I feel that in your translations. Um, and it's interesting to hear that you worked as a as a stonemason. I didn't know that. Um, and um, so you write about Robinson Jeffers uh, in this book quite a bit. The uh, late nineteenth, twentieth century landscape poet. Am I remembering correctly that he lived in a in a stone house by the yeah. sea? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's so a good then... connection. Yeah, he he had actually <laughs> helped build the house, and he built um a, the, I think he built by himself the tower next to it next to that. Ah, okay. So you maybe have multiple levels of affinity with Jeffers than the poetry and the stone masonry. Yeah. 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 So that's, so... that's part of his kind of elemental approach to things. It kind of makes sense. He he sort of learned that by working on stone and living on the actually the coast south of San Francisco where the bookstore is. Mm, mm. Yeah. So you you call Jeffers like the originary American landscape poet or you know, one of the earliest eco poets, and you situate him as part of this longer lineage of Western thinkers who have been um, kind of rediscovering a, a more paleolithic view of the integration of the wild and the human and discovering it within Western cultural terms. Um, so, but I'm curious, how, how did you come across Jeffers in your own reading? And um, was it through a philosophical lens or did you just discover him as a poet and then, and then realize what you'd found? Yeah, it's it was as a poet because I started out as a poet, and so and I and I grew up in the West, so I was, I was very, really my earliest influences were those sort of California poets, uh, Gary Snyder and Kenneth Rexroth, and then Robinson Jeffers is kind of like their um, predecessor. So yeah, I was reading him more as a poet. And um, but he, you know, he back then he was a little inaccessible. There were there have recently been two uh, really great collections of his short lyric poems where you can really start seeing the the philosophical depth of what he's doing. That one of them by Robert Haas, who lives a little north of the bookstore. Uh, it's all about California, um, and and it was sort of later that i started thinking of really becoming thinking as i became more philosophically um interested in all of this to start thinking about him more and more philosophically um mm -hmm. yeah 
Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, he wasn't a poet who I was familiar with. So I've enjoyed um, getting to learn about him reading your book. Yeah, he's kind of an outsider. I mean, in grad, if you go to college and take a class in sort of modern poets, you'll read all of the sort of East Coast, um, Pound and Williams and T.S. Eliot and uh, Stevens, but you won't read him, even though he was he was the other great poet of the year. And he, he, he his first book was right at the same time as all those other people. And in the mid twenties, mm. um, but he's but he's not. He's much more philosophical. He wasn't interested in the sort of formal experimentation that the East Coast people were were uh, engaged in. Um, and he also was he not a big fan of the human race, and that made him challenging for a <laughs> lot of people. He he was. It is not that unusual for us now, I think, but he was really questioning our human-centered just worldview and just the idea that we're the center of everything and we can do all the damage we want. He, he talked about the sort of the whole kind of living cosmos as a kind of organism and that that's where value um, resides, not in sort of in our human preoccupation. So he's a yeah, great critic of environmental destruction, of war, of just sort of all the things humans are doing. And, you know, that was a hundred years ago and it's, it hasn't stopped. Yeah, I felt that in, in reading the excerpts of his poetry that you put in the book. And it, even though I didn't know about him and I'm not nearly as familiar with the poetry of the era as you are, there was something familiar to me um, in the kind of cultural zeitgeist he was writing from, maybe mostly in comparison to William James, actually, who, who I'm more familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, you described Jeffers as sort of writing at the terminological limit, like he still felt himself to be in a kind of pantheistic or with, with Judeo-Christianity in the background, yeah. um, in contrast to a, a, a much more naturalistic Taoist or Chan understanding of the empirical universe. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's still a, a, almost a reference to a kind of deism there which reminded me of, yeah, J James's philosophy. I think he's in a similar way struggled to get past the limits of some of the terminology that he was actually kind of opposed to. Does that yeah. sound right to you? Yeah, I don't know James that well, but you can see this happening all, even all the way back, Thoreau and Whitman. They're all they're all at the at the at sort of at the pushing the conceptual constraints of their time. Uh, and you, you, you mentioned terminology that, so it's like they, they still needed to use the word God to refer to this kind of wondrous world or cosmos. Jeffers did too a few times. But if you actually look at what the, so there was a kind of pantheism um, going on that began with the sort of British romantics and the um, continental romantics and the philosophers and the enlightenment um but uh if you actually but if you actually look at what jeffers is describing when he says something like, oh yeah he has this famous phrase the wild god of the of this world i think it is and um but if you but unlike most pantheism which still has enough of this sort of monotheistic christianity in it that the humans are still at the center of this of this pantheistic world that is it's the world is sort of divine and we're sort of and we sort of struggle to experience the divine in the world or something like that for jeffers the human is absolutely not the center of of things the human is the the cosmos and you know now this is all familiar ideas for us but the cosmos is completely indifferent to us um it's just going to keep moving it's it's this elemental force and we you know we're causing problems, but you know he says over and over we're, we're gonna we're gonna disappear at some point, and the and then the earth will sort of heal over and keep going. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I I do feel like that's still very much a challenge to modern thought, modern environmental thought, modern culture. Yeah, um, that idea of decentering humans as um, yeah, what's most cosmologically important um, or what's most personally important. Um, 
So that kind of brings me to another major thinker who you write about in the book, uh, Aldo Leopold, mm -hmm. the mid-century environmentalist. And um, you write in chapter six, you quote him a couple of times about his land ethic and how he came to think that um, without a paradigm shift in values, without a, a cultural or maybe even a spiritual shift, um, just the, the logic of needing a new land ethic wouldn't go very deep. Um, so for instance, you quote him on page 51 of the book saying, no important change in ethics was ever accomplished without an internal change in our intellectual emphasis, loyalties, affections, and convictions. The proof that conservation has not yet touched these foundations of conduct lies in the fact that philosophy and religion have not yet heard of it. When I read that quote, it made me think of a something Wendell Berry wrote once. Um, it was something like, it doesn't matter if we come up with a way to make enough cheap solar panels for everyone in the world, we, we could find a way mm -hmm. to destroy the world using solar panels. That, that's paraphrasing, <laughs> but it was right, something like right. that. He was basically saying, if we don't look at the underlying greed, we may just look, you know, find a new way to destroy the world. So, yeah. um, but anyway, you, you have some really interesting writing in this part of the book, trying to probe deeper into that. What is the structure of thought, philosophy, spirituality that allows us to maintain such a sense of separation from wild nature, even for people who have no conscious affiliation with Judeo-Christianity, with religion of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if you could say a few words about that like the sources of it yeah yeah um yeah i think wendell berry is probably right you know we, we sort of think that technology is going to sort of somehow build us out of this but i don't really think it is you know i think i think he's right that whatever advances there are You know, if you if you make power more ec ecological, people just then it just means we can use more power, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Elon Musk will still be trying to go to the moon, and you know, on and on. It it really, I think Leopold was right. It really requires a kind of um, paradigm shift, and that's what I'm trying to talk about in this book. Um, and yeah, the source. I mean, there's another writer from the, I think, 67 that I quote in there, uh, along with Leopold Lin Waidu, who says that the real source of the environmental crisis is the Christian idea from Genesis that um, the world is made for humans, the God made the world for humans, that it's here for us to exploit, um, to populate, to dominate, and that that's sort of the, the basic problem. Um, but I think it goes back um, a lot further than that. And I, you know, the sort of the basic uh, idea in this book is that the real problem is this idea that we are these sort of, however you describe it, souls or spirits, centers or whatever that are detached from the world around us, that are separate, and that the world is sort of there for us. And that idea goes goes way, way back, I think, in the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer cultures, that idea wouldn't have happened because there was no, there was no separate space. People just humans just moved through the environment like everything else. But when the Neolithic came, when um, agricultural villages began, suddenly humans had established these sort of human space separate from wild space. And they began to, uh, the the villages that were permanent villages and fields, and they started controlling nature um, in the form of domestic animals and plants. So it's kind of interesting that it wasn't so much a you know this philosophical move. It was a a, ch a change in material culture that had when it happened. It would just happen because it seemed to practice to work in a practical utilitarian way for people but it also created a, a, a kind of revolution in consciousness and the way people understood themselves in the world. And I think then it got, it was exacerbated when um, writing came along because with writing, before writing, 
language was this kind of thing that just went through our heads, right? It, 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 speech or thought was constantly appearing and disappearing. And so there was no sense of a, a kind of permanent interior space. You know, language would have been experienced like weather almost. Um, language and thought, the sort of internal, um, what goes on in the mind would have been experienced kind of like weather. Um, it's kind of interesting to think that in those days, the total body of knowledge of any person or any small group of people amounted to the extent of memory um, of the people in the group. And otherwise, all the knowledge was just disappearing. It's like there wasn't an encyclopedia, you could go look things up. So it's writing that changed that, writing established sort of thought and language as this permanent realm. Once you could write it down, it seemed timeless because you could take it some, it could go somewhere else and someone else could read it. Uh, you could come back to it later and read it again. You could revise it, change it. So that created this sense, this sense of um, a kind of changeless, even like what became eternal spirit. And I think Greek philosophy and Christianity sort of build on that. They're sort of mythologizing that again, a, a, um, a transformation in material culture that just began because it was useful, but then had this profound impact on consciousness. And then Greek philosophy and Christianity sort of gave that a philosophical um, embodiment or mythology. So, yeah, so it isn't so, so that's why it really stays inside of us, even if we're, even if we're totally post-Christian, which we're not. And certainly the, the, our leaders and the, you know, the people who are determining policy and industrial leaders, political leaders, et cetera, et cetera, they're not really past it maybe most people in this audience are. Nevertheless, it stays with us. And I think that's part of the reason why. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I've often thought it would be very nice if if the country, the US, got to the point where political leaders didn't feel that they had to reference God in their justifications for things they do, you know, even yeah. if they believe in God, but to sort of more fully uphold the pluralism that, you know, of, of belief, including, yeah, atheists and um, non-theistic religious folks like right. myself. So, um, so, you know, on the one hand, if, if there's this possibility for, a, if there's always the possibility that a culture will develop in the direction of, of what you call the, you know, s separate spirit center, the isolated sense of self with this, delusion of, of kind of permanence through language and alienation mm -hmm. from nature. And on the other hand, then there there's always the chance to reconnect with wild nature, you know, externally or internally. And you, you describe that in this book and in other works of yours having happened, that cultural shift toward alienation and then and then back toward co connection into integration with wildness in ancient China. So yeah. I was wondering if you could say a few things. I, I imagine not everyone knows um, how similar, um, you know, educated elite, the educated elite level of ancient Chinese culture was to our current culture. I wonder if you could say a few things about what that was like and how it took place that um, both of those moves happened in ancient Chinese culture, the alienation and then the rediscovery of, of a kind of um, deep primordial connection to wildness. Yeah, okay, yeah, good question. Yeah, and what interests me is that the same, the same, I'll, I'll describe it, but what interests me is the same transforma cultural transformation has happened in the West. This really began 200 years ago and has been, and is now kind of picking up steam. And that's what one of the real interesting things for me in this book. But yeah, in, yeah, in ancient Chinese, um, the the people who built ancient Chinese culture were, you know, they were the educated elite. Um, but for those people, they th those people lived very much like us. They they were intensely textual, highly educated, mostly working as bureaucrats in offices, not just like we do. 
They had um, a diversified market economy. They had money, um, all sort of in contrast to, for instance, um, like I think I'll get to in a minute, Paleolithic cultures, which provide another model for us to get out of our way of thinking. But those cultures are so radically different from us that it's unclear how valuable they are as models. So yeah, in ancient China, long ago, 3000 years ago, no, I mean, 3000, 2000 BCE, um, China was a monotheism that looked pretty much like structurally at its foundations, like um, the Judeo-Christian West, the emperor ruled because the emperor um, supposedly had uh, access to the to this monotheistic god and um, could influence what so and therefore could influence what happens in the world, and that all crumbled because the um, the rulers were so corrupt that people finally overthrew them, and what we think of as the beginning of Chinese philosophy is like Confucius and Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, the Analects. Those were philosophers trying to sort of build something out of the ruins of that monotheism. And they were doing it um, with an empirical basis, demanding you know an empirical accuracy, which is familiar to us in a kind of scientific age. Um, and they were also used, it also looks like that worldview, they built it out of a kind of Paleolithic worldview that had survived under the surface of that um, monotheistic power structure. And we, it's, we can see that in a couple of ways. One is the Tao Te Ching, where this is really first formulated, is pretty clear. It's very fragmentary, very mysterious. It's pretty clearly um, built out of fragments from a very ancient oral tradition. Um, and other, the, the Book of Songs, the earliest book of poetry is also built out of um, oral tradition. So we know that that was a game that was being played then. Um, yeah, so they, you know, they sort of replaced this monotheism where um, people are sort of spirits that belong in the spirit realm of heaven, just like the Judeo-Christian, with um, an idea kind of like we were talking about with Jeffers of the, the cosmos as this living dynamic organism, and also importantly, self-generating, because um, the Tao Te Ching describes this cosmos, this um, the Tao, as female, over and over and over, as mother, as female. So it's a radically different from this male sky god from outside creating things, as in that early uh, Christ, uh, Chinese monotheism and in Judeo-Christian um, monotheism. That was replaced by this idea that what was um, the essential nature of things was this self-generating kind of a magnificent cosmos that was at, at heart female. So it's interesting. So so they get that far, and that's that's a, and that and that and that humans belong absolutely in a fundamental way to that. And then Taoist practice, Chan Buddhist practice, that's Zen Buddhist practice, painting, poetry, all the arts. They were all about reweaving consciousness back into that um, that um, the natural process of the cosmos that is reintegrating, and that's the thing that I think in the West is so lost. We're so detached from it that we can take this instrumental and exploitative relation to it. Um, I mean, just to give a tangible example, here in Vermont, where I live, Native Americans live. This is everybody knows this story. Ten thousand years with very little environmental disruption, Europeans came with this detached instrumental relation to land. And in a hundred years, they'd clear cut the whole state. So it's just this utterly dramatic difference. And the difference is a conceptual framework. The, one of them, humans are completely integrated into, woven into the ecosystem. It would never occur to them to sort of step outside and take this instrumental attitude and destructive attitude toward it, though um, Europeans quite the opposite. So what I find so fascinating is that this, that in the same way as ancient China, Judeo-Christian monotheism began crumbling in the, you know, in the enlightenment in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And then we see it most dramatically, um, it becomes a kind of pantheism, um, before this, 
nature was seen as this horrible, ugly, terrifying place that needed to be brought in under sort of into the God's order. Um, this whole this assumption we have today that nature is this beautiful, sustaining uh, place uh, didn't exist until really sort of around the British Romantic poets. And those Romantic poets had this complete, completely, they, they began thinking that mountains and wilderness were wonderful places that they could go for um, and sort of reconnect with something essential, which they thought of as sort of divine. Um, and as, a, as um, almost an antidote to um, industrial age commercialism of the cities. And then that from there, that goes to Thoreau and to John Muir and the Sierras out, out there near, again near the bookstore. Um, and Robinson Jeffers and the modern environmental movement. And the really interesting thing, just like ancient China where that came from Paleolithic oral tr wisdom traditions, well, the word, Wordsworth, the British Romantics, and this whole revolution in Europe was largely driven by accounts that had come there of Native American cultures by um, travelers writing travelogues and also by sort of um, often Jesuit, but sort of scholars, intellectuals who um, were in the, in the New World talking to Native American sort of elders and philosophers and sort of having philosophical debates with them. And that stuff was written up and published in Europe in, a, in, a, in quite a number of different books and different sort of forms. And they were quite popular and um, they provided this um, radically different view of the humans and human relation to nature. And that's what sort of generated um, British romanticism. And then as I said, and that runs straight through to modern American environmental movement. So it's kind of wonderful to think the modern environmental movement and our feeling that nature is sustaining and valuable began with Native Americans. It just circuitous route. It went from Native Americans to Europe and then came back. Yeah, that's that's quite an interesting point. And I think um, it also picked up some difficulties along the way because you know for instance i notice you use the phrasing that the native americans in vermont were integrated on the landscape which which is very different than saying that it was you know pristine or that they didn't touch it at all um i i remember reading the historian william cronin's book Ch right. changes in the land where he describes so interestingly and beautifully that native americans had no problem um, altering landscapes around them, but they did it with a view toward harmonious, you know, biodiversity, toward sustainability, you know, so for instance, um, setting uh, intermittent fires that are actually healthy for the landscape, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. which is really different than the view, which I think is a quite a necessary view given how badly we've damaged the planet, but of, um, you know, don't touch it at all, don't have any people there at all. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what we have to resort to in some cases because they're because mm -hmm. of overpopulation and lack of education. But it's, you know, to say um, that humans simply shouldn't be in a landscape is, is in a way to preserve the the separation between humans and and, and yeah, the right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really is a matter of living in a sort of in that kind of harmonious, integrated way and still living is, yeah, Native Americans yeah. were here, they were hunting, they were gathering, they were doing some, you know, minimal sorts of agricultural things mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, and uh, doing controlled fires to sort of uh, organize organize the, the, the forests in certain ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is. You're right. That's more useful to us than this. Just some kind of dream of no human intervention or uh, or whatever. Um, that's that's just not useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, we have a couple of questions appearing in the uh, chat, which I want to get to. Okay. Um, but before before we go there. 
Um, David, was there anything else you wanted to say about the book just to, to sort of wrap up our part of the discussion? Anything that I should have asked you about it that I didn't? I don't think so. I think, but although you talk, speaking of the, uh, this is actually kind of off topic, but it's, it's um, something that's um, fascinated me lately of the Native Americans have, um, having some impact on, on land. Uh, I, it, it appears that Native Americans in a lot of places and I moved into the Neolithic um, and started farming, started settling mm. in permanent villages, especially in the Southwest. We, it's, it's famous, the cliff dwellings and Chaco Canyon and stuff. And then it's interesting that apparently they began to realize what the, the implications of that were in terms of the society means once you have the Neolithic, you can have hierarchical society. Some people can acquire wealth in terms of land and um, agricultural surplus and um, and also that it's a lot harder, harder work. So they quite, so apparently in a, a lot of places in Native America, they quite simply, the people kind of re revolted and went back to hunter gatherer lifestyle. Uh, and that sort of, sort of works in with your idea that, oh, there was some agriculture going on. They were, were there, they were sort of operating on this, on this um, cusp of, agricultural life, Neolithic agricultural and Paleolithic um, hunter-gatherer, but sort of yeah. making a choice. No, we don't want it. We don't want that, that kind of separation. We don't want, we don't want to work, uh, live in these little villages and, and, and work 12 hours a day to try to make farming work. Yeah, I was thinking about the village of Cahokia. I don't know if you've had a chance to read about that, but it's no. it's near modern day St. Louis. And it was, um, I think archaeologists say it was the largest Native pre-Columbian Native American settlement in North America, um, you know, mm -hmm. not not in, not including the South American empires. Mm -hmm. But um, and it's very clear that some kind of religious, you know, development, maybe you know, uh, hierarchical religious cult developed there based on the buildings, and then it all fell apart and people moved away, exactly like you were just saying. Yeah. So that makes me think of your the story you tell about um, um, about ancient China and the, the ways that cultures can move in and out of those kinds of developments. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of promising because it feels like in our culture. This is a juggernaut that you, it's hard to imagine stopping, right? Yeah. This, yeah. this, this sixth extinction, um, you know, this the capitalist um, thing, you know, it's hard to imagine stopping. But that's an that's those those people did the same kind of radical kind of revolutionary transformation. They just completely said no to a whole. A whole way of life and walked away from it for something better. So you yeah. know maybe it's possible to to make wholesale change like that. Yeah, and I, I like the optimism that's inherent in yeah. believing we can without knowing for sure if we can or not, because there's never been a culture with the kind of energy density and momentum that ours has. But yeah. Yeah. well, let, okay, let me turn to some questions. We've got okay, four good. in the chat now. Um, we'll go for ten or at most fifteen more minutes. Um, okay. So um, Wendover asks, um, this is going back to our question about translation and Chinese poetry. Sorry if I missed it, but do you have a good starting place for the Chinese poetry you were reading earlier? Um, um, does that mean a good starting place? So actually a good starting place would be <laughs> the list of David's books in the front of this book. <laughs> um, if you buy Wild Mind, Wild Earth, you can see these are all translations that David has done, including uh, a number of books that are all translated poetry. Um, besides your own work, David, do you have any recommendations for yeah. someone to dive into translating? Well, the, the, there's poetry? one. There's one anthology called Mountain Home that is all about sort of rivers and mountains poetry. So it's kind of like right up, um, exactly the kind of thing that this the Wild Mind, Wild Earth was talking about. It's sort of the poetic tradition in China that that was eco essentially eco poetic. Mm, great. You say that that book is called Mountain Home. Yeah. Okay. Just put that in the chat. Okay. 
And then um, we have some questions that are more um, uh, about the philosophical and ecological issues we've been talking about. So um, Basia asks, I appreciate your idea that attention to things is a deep ecological practice. Can you expand on this? I'm also thinking about Gay Watson's book, Attention. So attention as a deep ecological practice. Oh yeah, that's a big that's a big question. Um, uh, yeah, and I sort of work around this quite a bit in this book because um, yeah, if you if you pay close attention to things, I mean, I talk about this in the book. It's a little more developed in terms of um, what we can learn from meditation. But at the end of it, attention is if if you see something clearly. And you, and you've kind of left behind. You only see something. There's a there's an art book. I forget what it's who it is, but seeing is forgetting the names of things, and that's true. It's you only truly see something wholly um, when you forget when you forget the name of it, and also when you've sort of your thought process has stopped. All the distractions have stopped. That's when you see completely, um, sort of purely. And that's kind of the end of Chan meditation practice. Um, and the reason that matters is because at that moment that you're wholly seeing that I, I that Chan talks about it as a moment when your mind is like a mirror, you're just mirroring what's in front of you. And so that's wholly your mental content at that time. At that moment, that separation between self and the world has ended. Because in that seeing, there's no thought, there's no sort of self separate from what you're seeing. So that's why I talk about it as a kind of ecological practice. It's a, it's a practice in, in seeing that we're not radically separate from the world. And then if we're not, then that problematizes something, what we take for granted, that exploitative instrumental distance from things. That comes that, that whole instrumental possibility comes from this detached separate self. And again, seeing with a mirror mind sort of shows you that that self is as a kind of illusion, and it's a it's a way of uh, well, it's another way of saying it. it's a way of feeling things inside of you, feeling a mountain, of feeling a river, and then that's where kinship comes from, which is the one of, like the passage I read was all about kinship, and it's an idea that keeps coming mm -hmm. back. In the yeah, I like that. And I like what you say at the beginning of the book about an orca joyfully leaping from the water. And then you say in the parenthetical aside, forget anthropomorphism because we're so kindred to them. We don't have to make this conceptual leap into concern about are we anthropomorphizing them? Because, you know, when you when you feel joy in another animate being, that's not a you don't have to leave yourself your own feelings and go into a conceptual place to know whether that's true yeah, or not yeah right yeah right. um okay so um so you asks are the people who think technology will save humans completely wrong or are they just avoiding the question um i think let me let me give a thought about that and see mm -hmm. if you agree david okay so, um to me there's a real middle way place to be had here. Um, one time I was at a teaching by the Tibetan Buddhist teacher Tsokni Rinpoche, and at the end of his teaching, he, he gave a kind of dedication, and he said something like, may there be um, profound shifts in the heart that allow us to have a new relationship with nature and stop our destruction, and may there also be mir miraculous technological changes <laughs> that help us to stop what we're doing immediately and right. to me that was maybe the best I ever heard because he he just avoided the sense of conflict um, between the one and the other maybe that's a positive expression of of what Wendell Berry was was saying but um, yeah. anyway where do you where do you land on that yeah I mean I, I basically agree with that yeah I, and I think to come back to um, we were talking about Leopold and the idea that you have to have a a kind of the right conceptual framework. Um, that is, you can deploy technology as instrumental and explo exploitative, which is sort of 
um, our assumptions, or you could deploy it as part of a, a kind of weave of human and, and the non-human. So it depends on how you use it. And that's what Leopold is saying. We, you need to have a new kind of what he, he spoke of as religion or philosophy underlying what you do. Um, because, yeah, and I mean, I, I think I come to that in the book and, and I say, well, you know, ancient China was not a, um, an ecological paradise, even though the philosophical system suggests maybe that would have been possible. And it was because of the sheer survival pressure of a, a very large population of people who had to cut down forests to heat their homes and who had to kill lots of animals, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we kind of have the possibility now not to do a lot of those things. We have the we have the possibility to be to to eliminate a lot of the destruction we're causing. It's of just a matter of the will of of of, th of of not thinking that humans are at the center of everything, um, and you know, feeling our kinship for things and and valuing. And I, this is a point I, keep, I make a, a bunch of times like that work, valuing other species and other individual by individual by individual, not just in this abstract species. We get exercised about species going extinct, but that's kind of an abstraction. It doesn't mean anything to the individual animals. And if they're kindred to us, their, their self-realization is just as important as ours. And it's only when you start worrying about the individuals that you're really valuing them um, and that that's the kind of that's and once once that change in um, you know what philosophy or religion not religion but um, in our well it's a change in our relationship to the non-human once that happens then yes technology is hugely promising but in, mm -hmm. unless it does then technologies as much as we talk about environmental environmental uh, issues and climate change, and we have the uh, you know the Egypt and Glasgow and Paris and Kyoto. It's not really going to change unless we have a reason to make a change. Yeah, um, I I really appreciate your use of that phrase, individual by individual by individual, and it it connects for me also to the factory farming of animals for meat because. Oh, yeah, right. Well, extinction, of course, species extinction is extremely, uh, brings up a lot of grief, but we also create, you know, I think the number is upward of 80 billion animals a year in order to destroy them and eat them. Right. In, in some ways, I feel like if humanity, yeah, survives into the future, they'll look back and and think uh, that that was as bad as, as anything else that we did. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, Nick, I see you've reappeared you here. Back. You do, you do. Hello. Uh, how is everybody? Hi. Very good. Ah, aha, I've reappeared. Uh, okay, we, we did have one more question if you wanted to. Uh, oh, uh, never mind. I That's not true. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I thought, but no, never mind. Um, so, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. That was really fun. Uh, one more time, the book is uh, Wild... So oh, sorry, let me get the actual thing. Wild Mind, Wild Earth. See, I knew I was going to call it Wild Earth, Wild Mind, and it was the opposite. Uh, <laughs> the, the book is Wild Mind, Wild Earth. You can get it at bookpassage.com. You can follow the link that I pinned straight to the top of the chat to go directly to our website to purchase it. We will. Uh, you can either pick it up from our stores or we can ship it to your house just like any other online retailer. Yes, even that one. Um, uh, <laughs> if you'd like to attend any more of these events in the future, you can again sign up for our newsletter or just check us out at bookpassage.com. We have all of our events posted up here. Um, and one last time, if uh, if the people, good people here, would like to find you elsewhere, uh, David Hinton, is that uh, is there somewhere else I can find you? Some other place you're speaking next? Um, Brooklyn Rail tomorrow at one o'clock. There you go. Brooklyn Rail is a, a ma sort of magazine in Brooklyn, so they, and they have a, an event series. And then, uh, Matt, if uh, uh, I don't know if you do too many speaking things, is there is there a place that can find you, or or uh, or are you okay? Um, sure. Well, let me let me shout out David's website. It's just davidhinton.net. If I right is that, right. is that it, davidhinton.net. You can see his other books and so forth. Um, 
And then uh, mattzeppelin.com is a, a kind of rinky-dink little website um, that I've got up, or you can visit shambhala.com uh, if you want to see um, David's books with Shambhala and all the other great books that we're publishing. Yes, excellent books over there at shambhala.com. I've uh, read quite a few off of them and from their press as well. Uh, I can highly recommend them. Thank you very much. One last time, everybody, for coming. I uh, hope to see you. Oh, hope to see you all in the next one. Bye. See you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.